Bill. Over there is Suzanne Chani. We talked about her earlier. She's all set up behind the bukla. Let's, um, let's have a seat, look at what she's doing, and, uh, and get to know the system. Sounds yeah? good. All right. Suzanne, yeah. let me start out by saying that I think it's the coolest thing that you are here. Thank right, you. Right, Bill? Yes, sir. We, we yes. were like looking at you and uh, it's such an interesting machine to, to begin with. Yes, it is. It's yeah. my true love. Your true love. <laughs> yes. <laughs> have you ever played yeah. on, a, on a book club before? I have not, no. Oh, hmm. Always wanted to. Mm. They're very rare. They're even rarer now than they ever were because the inventor Don Buchla passed away last year, mm. and so really it's a it's a limited edition. edition. Let's start maybe also for Bill to sort of go back to when you were younger, mm -hmm. um, born in Indianapolis, 1964. Yes, I don't remember that. 46. No, 46. 46. 46. <laughs> 1946. Yeah. In, into a, a big family, and this is what I like. It was your mom who brought a piano to the house yes. and some old classical records that she found. At a fire sale. Yeah. Yes. And, and this is how you, you got to know Bach and, and I grew up on Yeah, I yeah. grew up on classical music, yeah. and I just, I love the romantics, you know, Greek, Rachmaninoff, uh, and, and Bach, you know, I love the, also the Baroque and yeah. the classical Mozart. Yeah. At a certain point, you went to study uh, composition at Berkeley. Yes. What kind of music were you making around that time? Well, I thought of myself as a composer. So I always did think of myself from the time I was a little as writing music. I don't mm. know where that came from, but I went, uh, I majored in music in college and then I went to get a graduate degree in composition. Mm -hmm at the University of California at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And in Berkeley was where I met the inventor Don Buchla. Because that's, that was my question. How did the classical girl lose her heart to a machine? Exactly. <laughs> it was a very disruptive time in general because it was the free speech movement. It was 1968. So for me to meet Don Buchla, who was a very alternative thinker, mm -hmm. uh, it fit in perfectly with the times. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and did you see him play on, on, on a bukla? Or can you remember when you first saw it? Uh, I went to work for him. Yeah. When I finished graduate school, I went to work in his factory. So what did I, you do there? I was assembling the circuit boards. But was it for you mm -hmm. um, like very clear um, at the beginning, like, okay, 
this is my instrument. I can, I can improvise with it. It really is a compositional, interactive machine. And I, all I can say is I was just very lucky to meet Don because I don't think any other instrument of the time or even beyond mm. has the conceptual power that this machine has. Mm -hmm. And when you say conceptual power, yeah. what do you mean? Is that um, he was designing a, a performance instrument. So mm -hmm. um, an instrument that you could play in real time, as they say. So instead of recording, instead of making a sound and recording it, making another sound, recording it, the way a lot of studio albums are done, and I've done a lot of those, um, the concept was to be in the moment, mm -hmm. nothing pre-recorded, and make the sound right there in the machine let you know what was going on. So it has a lot of lights that are communicating. So it tells you the intensity. Maybe you should let us see how it, how it works. Because yeah. uh, to a lot of people, also to me, uh, it's cable spaghetti. Right. <laughs> cable spaghetti. <laughs> cable spaghetti. But maybe you could, okay. maybe you could show us sure, you know, briefly like, to. like, you know, uh, how, it, how it works. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Let's, Let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing really is to see what's here. You have to be clear because it looks very complicated. Yes. <laughs> it's, it does. It's an analog modular system. And the word modular means it's in modules. It's in little pieces. And each modular unit is this big. So like I have, a box. Yeah. So I have 18 box units in this system. Mm -hmm. Each box is specialized. Uh, this one is the output panel, and uh, it has a spatial control, so you can see from the lights. Wow. The lights tell you what's going on. But when you say what's going on, what do you mean? Like, what is it telling you? Well, it's telling me the position in space. So, for instance, let's see if we have a sound here. Okay, this is a sound. Let's try a different sound. Oh, it doesn't matter what the sound is. Okay, so here's a sound, yeah. and it's moving in circles. It's moving randomly, actually. Yeah. You can see where it's going. Yeah. So that's voltage controlled. I could take a different voltage and move it differently. I can take this off. So I can change the way the space moves just by changing the voltage. Yeah. So the essence of, of these machines is voltage control, yeah. which is that a change in voltage affects a parameter, whatever that parameter is. That mm -hmm. was spatial movement. It could be the position of a filter. It could mm -hmm. be a pitch. Mm -hmm. It could be... Because uh, can, you, can you play in all kinds of scales? Of course, yes. I mean, you tune it yeah. you know, to whatever you want. Yeah. There's nothing preset in this. It's very fluid. This keyboard, for instance, Uh, wow. is not, it's He's really like, a, wow, <laughs> oh my God, a, kid in a, a candy store. It's a control <laughs> center. So I have tuned it to play on these keys, but it doesn't play on this, yeah. it doesn't play on this key. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I've told it to this, to trigger. Stop, start. Did you realize, like, I'm a pioneer, like, what I'm developing here is totally new, also as a woman. Well, I noticed that there was a huge gap. When I would perform, my audience honestly didn't understand that the sound was coming from the machine. Mm. And I was very frustrating. Mm. So I had to be very patient and explain everything. So I was very didactic. Mm -hmm. And I did feel a responsibility to educate my audience. Mm -hmm. But who educated you? Don Bugla. <laughs> you know? So he really also taught you to play it? Mm, no. He who didn't. taught you to play it then? Okay. <laughs> the, way, the way you learn, because back then there were, there, back then, you know, in the old <laughs> days, uh, there were no manuals, there were no books, there were no classes. You did it by living with the machine. Trial and error. And living yes. with it like, like in your house. Yes, and developing a relationship with it. So spending time, lots of time, 
you know, it's kind of like I'm just I, trying. Like, like a violin in a way, you don't just pick that up and play mm -hmm. it. You develop a technique. Mm -hmm. So I loved it. And, and it was I, always on in your house. Yes, it was plugged always on. in. Yeah. Always. It still is now that I've come back to it. <laughs> is that something you can relate to? The fact that, that your, your instruments are plugged in all the time? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's my mantra in my studio in London is, you know, everything has to be plugged in all like, you know, so there's one switch when you walk into the studio. So at any point, any idea is, is you know, you can realize it, mm. realize it like that. You're going to play uh, a piece okay. for us. Okay. Um, what I really want to look into, like, quickly is um, some footage of, of your career, okay. just to see the, the well, the changes you've made with the bookla. Okay. So, yeah, let's, let's... It's quite amazing what you have done. And... Um... What do the Coca-Cola pop and pour sound effect? And the Atari video game's audio logo have in common? They were both created by Suzanne Chani, a pioneer in electronic music. <laughs> when you look at this, what do you what do you think? Well, I remember as remember everything as if it were yesterday. Mm. I can remember making that Coca Cola sound. I can remember. I mean, it's it was really part of me mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, doing all those those uh, sounds, and I had a great time doing it because um, I could work as a pure artist, really, in commercial mm -hmm. uh, production because nobody knew what I was doing. So I had complete freedom. Freedom, yeah. yeah. When I came into the business, I had no competition. Somehow I lucked mm. into a field where there wasn't anybody else, and so they had to use me. When I look at, you know, um, over the span of your career, I think persistence also, you know, ha you know is made a... Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm looking at you because I know that persistence is something that you I think the power of persistence is something that you learned um, from being on tour, maybe, with, with Snarky Puppy. That's right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's the one thing I, I tell any student of mine, the, like, it's the first thing I could ever get across is just is persistence, you know. There's, yeah. there's so many amazing artists out there, but I, I feel like often maybe part of the reason you might not have heard of them is, is perhaps a lack of persistence. It's mm. not necessarily a lack of talent or... It's just kind of being willing to just get up and, yeah. and go and have another go again yeah. and again and again. And I think it applies <laughs> on uh, Suzanne because you knew I want to do music mm -hmm. because that was the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Like to, to, exactly. to produce that was your... the ultimate goal. Right? Yes, and that drove everything. Yeah, but it yeah. was hard for you to get your music out at a certain time in the States. Why was, well, it, was it hard? It was impossible. Impossible, I mean, even. Yeah. Those were the days when you had to have a record deal or you couldn't put music out. Mm -hmm. Nobody could make a CD. There was no online release. You had to have a major label. So yeah. the woman who is responsible for the Coca-Cola sound and the Atari and Black and & Decker and series and films and the, the, the pinball machines was having a hard time getting out there what she really wanted to get out there. Which is why I did the commercials, because I made money. Yeah. And I used that money. I self-produced my first two albums. Yeah. Yeah. Shall so. we listen to, to uh, one of your own compositions? Yeah. OK. So this, I'm going to play something on the Buchla. Yeah. OK, this is the Buchla 200E. And uh, okay. it has a memory. It has a memory, yeah. So I do have some memories. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible, huh? Eh? Yeah. It's still it's so fascinating what kind of sounds this thing can produce and, and to see the way you're you're trying to not trying, the way you're controlling it and sometimes it feels like it has a sort of a mind of its own, and then you're like, yes. try to dominate it again. Yes, exactly. It's very interesting. 
just just being here, so I just gen, uh, I, I really experienced the, the kind of 3D element of the instrument. It, it really, you really get. I mean, obviously you're in kind of surround sound here almost, but like if you really get that sense that it's it's so much more than just a chord or a pad or like there's just there's so many layers and they're all going in such different directions. It's it's really exciting. Yeah. How yeah. is it for you to be back on stage, just you and the bookla because. You stopped for a while, yeah. And now you're back doing it. How is it for you in this time? Well, it's really exciting because my audience is a new audience. They understand. Oh. They wear skinny jeans. They wear skinny <laughs> jeans, and they they have the you know they they know analog. When I first played 40 years ago, nobody knew what was going on. It's a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. It's much more exciting. Mm. And that's why I'm out doing it, because I, I feel that I have, you know, a connection to the historical roots of this medium. Mm -hmm. and, and before, you know, it was a visionary time mm -hmm. in the 60s. And, and then the vision didn't get manifested. Mm. So now I'm back here. I don't... Uh, you know, I'm not playing an instrument that other people can get up and buy and play, but it's going to have an impact on the going forward mm. of the design. Definitely, yes. Yeah, yes. definitely. I, I, I was curious as to what your thoughts were on the arrival of the digital age and, and how you feel, whether or not you feel that that has kind of uh, blossomed the creative potential or whether you feel like the analog is always going to be your preference and that's really where when things are hands on you can you can kind of grow from from grassroots a little bit more and that's the distinction really because analog was hands on mm. you turned a knob and you got a change digital was menus it was deep i mean my sequencer is digital so i can't perform it you know, it's right. there, it's got the pitches, but I yes. can't interact with it because I'd have to go through a menu. Mm. So, but it's compact. My old one was that big, you <laughs> know, so that's a compromise. Yeah. But uh, I think that, um, you know, digital, people don't want to play with a mouse. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, you have to be in, you need an interface mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to play. And I think people are tired of them. Menu-driven. Yes. Mm. Well, are you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly am. What, what, what would happen if, if I put you there, oh. you stay here, <laughs> and um, uh -oh. we combine uh -oh. whatever uh -oh. worlds uh -oh. whatever worlds needs to be combined? Yeah. A bit of digital, a bit of analog, okay. a bit of classic, yes. a bit of all the things that the two of you Okay. Carry inside. Let's do it. Yeah, All it right. was such a pleasure to have you, thank you. Suzanne it was my and it was really and, fun uh, to and you. Bill. Amazing. Amazing. Let's see what's let's let's see what happens. All right. So. I'm so curious. <laughs> <laughs> as long as we go to outer space, I'm I'm happy. Okay. <laughs>